Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this very special University of Maryland virtual town hall event. It is the first of its kind, and there are thousands of you, faculty, staff, and students from the University of Maryland who are joining us today, uh, and we thank you. So my name is Katie Lawson. I am the Chief Communications Officer here at the University of Maryland. I will be moderating today's event along with Brian Allman, the Acting Associate Vice President for Marketing and Communications. Um, I want to sincerely thank you for taking the time to join us today. And on behalf of all of us, uh, we hope that you and your families are well. This afternoon, we will hear brief remarks from a number of leaders at the university, and then we will pivot as quickly as possible to Q&A. Uh, we want to answer as many of your questions today as possible. Though all of our participants are automatically on mute, uh, and cannot be seen, I want to quickly make the announcement that we are recording today so that we have an archive uh, and hopefully reach the largest possible audience. Uh, you will also know that we are captioning today. Uh, so that is a, a function you can turn on at the bottom of your screen or it may be automatically populating for you. We also want to make today as engaging as possible. So there will be a couple of poll questions that we will ask our audience later in the program. And lastly, perhaps most importantly, we want to hear from you uh, by using the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so please go ahead and submit your questions and we have received a number of them in advance. So now that we have those housekeeping items out of the way, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Um, our president did want us to come together as a university community and connect virtually. So I would like to turn it over to our president, Wallace Lowe. Thank you, Katie and Brian for organizing this virtual town hall and to all the students, faculty and staff of the University of Maryland, thank you so much for joining in this town hall, all 3000 plus of you. Let me begin by saying that uh, the purpose of this meeting is for us, the leadership of the university to hear from you, your concerns, your questions, your feelings, and your experiences because this is we are in the midst of one of the greatest upheavals public health wise economic financially one of the greatest upheavals in the history of our country and for that matter in the history of the world and i know that many of you are experiencing great difficulty uh, you may have friends and family members who are ill. You may have lost loved ones. There may be financial hardship. We're all in this together. And for this total upending of your lives, I want to say I'm sorry. And I want to express my sincerest um, sympathies. But it's also time when we have come together. We have almost overnight move to work and to study in an online environment, this was not easy to do. So for your support, for your caring for others, for what you have contributed to this university and to your communities, I also want to express my deep appreciation and gratitude. So what, of the, what triggered this is that we have begun a process of planning for the reopening of the physical campus. I've already sent out a letter, and let me emphasize, this is a very gradual, careful process. We turn on one faucet at a time, we don't open the floodgates. And I would simply like to reiterate the key principles, because what we want to do is to bring back education, the research enterprise, student life, all the extracurricular and co-curricular activities and social activities that make for a wonderful student experience, intercollegiate athletics, and also the administrative operations of the university. So the principles that guide us to move from working in a virtual environment to an in-person environment is first and foremost the health and safety of all of our people. That is the absolute guiding principle in everything that we do. 
In addition, these areas I've mentioned are very important. So we want to support and strengthen those areas. And we want that education, research, intercollegiate athletics, administration, continue to be excellent in what they do, preserving excellence. The third major factor, or principle, if you will, is that when we make these decisions, we have to take into account our fundamental values. And those values include inclusion and equity. And the final principle is we need to be in communication. We have to listen to you. We have to engage you in the process of planning the reopening. And that's why we want to communicate with you. And this is one of the reasons why we have this town hall meeting. Let me simply say that I'm sure like you, I have spent hours and hours poring over epidemiological data, statistical studies, all of the plans of the state. But I just want to share with you three incidents because these incidents are far, far more meaningful to me than any of the statistics and research studies I've looked into. And in fact, that's what led me to have to ask that we have this virtual town hall. The first one was shortly after we announced that we were closing the campus, the students had to leave. I was walking through the campus and I ran into this housekeeper. We've known each other for several years. We always speak in Spanish. And she approached me and said, now that the dormitories are going to be closed, does that mean I don't have a job? I'm the only breadwinner in my family. My family will not have food. We may not be able to pay our rent. All I can do was to give her a big hug and say, we will work together. Then shortly after I wrote out that let, wrote the letter about how we plan to reopen the university, I got a letter from a, a professional track faculty member who has taught at this university for 22 years. And in that letter, she said, she has two teenage daughters. She lost her husband. And she says, she wrote, I'm very, very concerned about coming back and teaching and maybe getting ill because I don't want to leave my two daughters alone in the world. That really, really hit home to me. And the third story I want to share with you was, it's another letter, and I've gotten several letters of this type, but this faculty member wrote and said, I'm feeling really guilty. Here I am at home, and I'm safe. I can still work remotely. I'm getting paid, but I know that most other people are not in the situation. And so what I would like to do I'm writing to tell you, I'm willing to go on voluntary furlough. I'm willing to cut my salary. In the spirit, I share sacrifice. Those instances brought this upheaval and made it personal. And so this is why I said to my team, I need to hear more stories. I need to know more about the experiences of people. I need their ideas because I hope these are not binary choices. So let me just conclude by saying thank you so much for your support of the university, for the support of members of your community, and for coming together to have this conversation today. Yes, thank you so much for those remarks, President Lowe. Uh, I would now like to invite Marianne Rankin, our provost, to make her remarks. Well, for taking time to be with us today. I wanna to give a special thanks to our students and faculty for all the work you all have done to quickly shift to teaching and learning remotely this semester and to our extraordinary staff who supported that move. I know this change presented huge challenges for everyone. And I so appreciate everyone's cooperation 
creativity and willingness to adapt to these unprecedented circumstances. I'd like to especially acknowledge the excellent work of the Instructional Technology Group from DIT, the staff of the Teaching and Learning Transformation Center, and the staff and faculty in undergraduate studies, and Dean Cohen, for all their extraordinary support of our remote learning effort, including uh, creating two new support websites, the keepteaching.com and keeplearning.com, that are meant to support both aspects of this um, endeavor. I think they're being copied across the country. So bravo and, and thank you. I'm really not sure how we would have managed this pivot to remote learning without them. Last week, and this is very much in line with what President Lowe just um, mentioned, last week we emailed a survey to all students in order to hear more from you about your experiences learning remotely during this onslaught of the epidemic uh, this, this spring. We, um, for those of you who've already filled it out, and um, I know a lot of you have, thank you very much. If you haven't done so yet, I really urge you to do so. Um, in about a week or so, we'll be sending out a similar survey to faculty and then following that, another one to staff. And we really want to hear back from all of you, from your individual perspectives, what worked, what didn't work, what are the priorities going forward, what do we need to understand better from your perspective as we go forward. We, we really want to use this information to better support what teaching and learning we're going to have to do going forward into the fall and your well-being. Um, as best we can. We've all been affected by this pandemic. As you know very well, it's changed how we live, how we work, how we relate, how we relate to our others, how we teach and learn. And everyone is under stress, it seems. But some members of our community are being hit especially hard and facing looming uncertainties and hardships presently and looking forward, as, as Pre President Lowe said. So I'd just like to add my two cents to his and remind us all that we need to be understanding of one another's experiences and, and situations right now. And we need to be as flexible and willing to accommodate individual circumstances as we can be, especially for our students. So thank you all for anything that you can do in this effort. Now, I know everyone is wondering what form teaching and learning will take next fall. And I want you to know that although we can't tell you the absolute answer right now, we're all working very hard to determine that. As President Lowe mentioned, most, most of us are working on different aspects of this question. So each of the vice presidents is working on, I think each one is working with a task force to address that. I've got an academic work group um, and I want to thank them for their service, analyzing what is possible in the fall, depending on the state of the pandemic and the state and federal directives at the time. We're working to establish contingency plans so that even if we're still under health and safety restrictions, we can offer some in-person education. That's certainly what we're hoping for. Probably with some courses entirely online, some in blended format, and some in person. We're also for the in person courses working to provide online on alternatives for those who are not able to safely take or teach in person until the uh, pandemic abates. Um, and as we look ahead to the fall, our goal is as I said, to provide options and choices for people and with all our fall planning to put health and safety first. And we are working as fast as we can to get you answers as soon as possible um, so that we, you can all plan ahead as, as uh, you would, I know, very much like to. Thank you once again for all you're doing to um, make possible this remote learning right now and remote teaching and take care, be well. Thanks. Thank you, Provost Rankin. Thank you for those remarks.
Um, as Katie mentioned up front, we'd like to make this session as interactive as possible. So right now we're gonna ask our first poll question. And that first poll question is going to be visible to you. And it says, what do you miss most about being physically on campus? And you guys can just click your answers. There you go. Seeing friends and colleagues, watching springtime bloom on campus, sending off our amazing seniors, or just collaborating with our, our friends and colleagues on campus. I know for me, it's been uh, seeing friends and colleagues on campus. Looks like most of you agree. Half, half of you are miss seeing friends and colleagues. All right, great. Thank you everybody for voting. And, and, and I think as, as President Lowe and, and Provost Rankin uh, uh, just said, um, we're hope, hopeful that that's gonna happen real soon for all of us so that we can get back on campus and see each other in a, in a safe environment. Um, I'd now like to pivot to our next uh, speaker, uh, our Vice President of Student Affairs, uh, Patty Perillo. President Lowe, thank you so much for bringing us all together today. It's a joy to be in community with so many Terrapins. I know that what I miss most and my colleagues in the Division of Student Affairs miss most are our students because our work is centered on you. We are here really to make sure that you succeed in all the ways that you can. Our work is really designed to make sure that you thrive, not just survive, but that you thrive. And so we've missed you a lot. And I know that I share that with all of the colleagues on this panel right now. We spend a lot of time talking about the vibrancy and joy that you bring to this campus and it just can't be matched without you here. So we look forward to your return because you will return. And to those graduating seniors, this will always be home so that you can come back too. So the work of Student Affairs does focus on our students. And so we have been thinking of all kinds of ways that we can offer our programs and our services and our resources virtually because we want to make sure that you succeed even when we are in a virtual environment. So all of the departments, from the Career Center to Parent and Family Affairs, from the Health Center, the Stamp Student Union, have been offering programs, resources, and services virtually for you, our students. And I wanna highlight a few of them to make sure that you know about them. I know that during this time, as the President and Provost have already stated, that our mental well-being is really important. It is certainly always important, but perhaps no greater time than a once in a century kind of pandemic. And so our counseling center is offering counseling to our students virtually, engaged in teletherapy. And they're also offering a variety of workshops for our students on really salient and important topics for our students. So we encourage you to check out that website to learn more students. For our faculty and staff, we have an app. It's called WellTrack. And you can download it using your UMD email. And it will allow you to assess your mental and emotional well being. And it offers you tools and techniques for managing your distress. I know that many of us are thinking about how we make sense of a meaning of what's going on in the world. And we have a need to connect spiritually. And so our campus chaplains are available for one on one conversations, for group conversations. They're also offering online services on the weekends if you're interested. And our health center is offering weekly, three times a week, meditation ses sessions. So we encourage you to check those out as well. I know that many of us are thinking about what are the ways that we remain physically well and physically healthy. And certainly RecWell is helping us stay the course. Again, faculty, students, and staff, using your UMD email address, you can go online and download exercise programs. You can actually exercise with our students who are live streaming. It's fabulous. RecWell is also launching a Keep Moving Challenge to take us into the summer, encouraging us to walk or jog or run as a way to stay physically well. And if you prefer one-on-one -on -one work, they actually have a virtual trainer program. Again, you can go online for a five-week program and get your own trainer to work out one-on-one, -on -one, what we know and know on certain terms that remaining emotionally, physically, spiritually well is really important always, but particularly now. And for our faculty and staff, the University Health Center is offering, of course, as always, our faculty staff assistance program. 
So if you need resource or coaching or short-term counseling, that's a place that you can go to right now as well. So we've, we've created this website called Keep Connected. It's a way for us to stay connected to you, our students. All the things that I just told you about, you'll find on that website, keepconnected.umd.edu, because we always want to stay connected to you. So students, check out these resources. We are still available for you. We always will. We care about you. We look forward to your return. And class of 2020, congratulations. You make us all very, very proud. Thank you very much, Patty, for all those resources and for that message for our students and, and our whole community. I would now like to invite our Vice President for Research, uh, Lori Lacasio, to make some remarks. Thank you so much. And I wanted to echo Patty's comments and, and thanking President Lowe for bringing us all together. It's really good to be back with you all. Um, for those of you who are involved in research on campus, you already are aware that we're operating under severe research restrictions which means that the university is performing only essential and limited exempted research that must be approved by the deans and myself. And these restrictions are in place until further notice. I recognize that for many of our researchers, this has put a real strain on your work because your work can't be done remotely. And I just wanna thank you all for your flexibility and your understanding during this time. It's also been truly inspiring to see our researchers, many of whom have put their personal research on hold and have now shifted their focus to research related to COVID-19. From creating personal protective equipment with 3D printing, to mapping the progress of the virus nationwide, to conducting cutting edge research into how viruses spread through the air and on surfaces, our researchers, our TERPs are making real impact. And looking forward to recovery, as President Lowe mentioned, research is one of the pillars of the framework for plans to gradually reopen campus. So I'd like to thank my colleagues across campus who have graciously agreed to join this important work group and look forward to reporting out soon our updates. For those interested in staying abreast of research at the, at the University of Maryland, please be on the lookout for an invitation to a research-specific virtual town hall later this, this month. Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Um, I would now like to introduce Georgina Dodge, our Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion. Georgina. Thank you so much, Brian. It's wonderful to be here with everyone today. As my colleagues have stated, we are living in difficult times. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted every aspect of our lives, and some individuals and communities have experienced negative impacts more than others. We are keenly aware of how the virus has disproportionately affected communities of color. We are a diverse UMD community, and we remain committed to fostering a culture that is inclusive, respectful, and safe for everyone in this online environment. I want to emphasize that all university policies remain in effect, and should you experience difficulties, you may continue to reach out to resources, such as the Office of Civil Rights and Sexual Misconduct, Bias Incident Support Services, formerly known as Hate Bias Response, and the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Of course, there are numerous other resources on campus within student affairs, as Dr. Perilla just mentioned, as well as HR and our Department of Public Safety that are available should you need assistance. And please consider staying connected and in community by subscribing to the weekly ODI newsletter, which gathers information about diverse events happening across campus, as well as resources. And to subscribe, you just need to go to this website, go.umd.edu slash ODI subscribe, all one word, ODI subscribe. As we chart our way forward, the university is committed to looking through the lens of equity 
as we work to reopen in some capacity. By examining the complex, complex issues that have been made more apparent by this pandemic and with diversity and equity top of mind, we can help rebuild a more equitable society. So let us continue to practice community care as we move forward learning and working in an online environment. Even though we must physically distance to help flatten the curve, the social support we offer each other is invaluable, both now and in the future. Please take care of yourselves and of each other. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gina. I appreciate that. We're going to pause here and have our second poll question of the town hall. Then we'll have one more speaker and move on to Q&A. So we'll go ahead and do the poll question now. That question is, what have you incorporated into your routine to manage the transition to an online environment? So more time outside, exercise, connecting with friends virtually, practicing a hobby. Wow, it's a pretty even split at the moment. After Patty walked through all those resources from Reckwell, I'm feeling like I know I have less excuse around exercise. Um, but yeah, it looks like virtual Zoom calls and Google Hangouts to connect with friends might be our winner. So thank you to everyone who's taken the time uh, to participate in the poll. Okay, so our final speaker today, I'd like to introduce uh, our, our Dean of our School of Public Health. Uh, he is also a former Acting Surgeon General of the United States, so we are very fortunate to have his expertise on our campus. Please welcome Dean Boris Lushniak. Great, thank you so much, Katie, and thank you to everybody who's gathered here today, everybody out there in the world of virtual connectivity. Uh, as mentioned, I'm the Dean of the School of Public Health. So um, first and foremost, this is an incredible public health crisis that we're in front of. I use that word incredible because I understand from all my experience, 28 years in the federal government of waiting for this moment from a public health perspective, planning for this. And yet I have to acknowledge, none of us obviously wanted this. So in the midst of all this, how do we react to something that's as earth shattering as a pandemic? First of all, I gotta remind you that, you know, in the 20th and 21st centuries, we've had four previous pandemics, all of them related to influenza. So this is the first non-influenza pandemic. The biggest one a hundred years ago, which on a relative scale kind of reminds us of where we're at right now worldwide spread. I also want to remind you of how early we are into this. And this actually will have an optimistic tone over it, right? December 31st, 2019, as many of us were preparing to celebrate the upcoming new year, was the first time that the World Health Organization office in China was informed of a small cluster of people with pneumonia of unknown cause. And the optimism that I'm gonna share with you right now is actually quite important to put out there. And that optimism stems from the ideas that we as humankind have never been at this interlacing before, i.e. a major pandemic going through the world, we've seen those, but never at the same time of the incredible advancement that we've seen in medicine, in science, in public health. December 31st, all this starts. Within a week, we have a brand new virus that's described. Right? It starts falling into the realm of being defined as a pandemic shortly after that. And what, that, what does that mean? That means that it's a brand new virus not seen before, one that our immune system is not ready to react to. Secondly, that it's spread person to person. And third, that it's serious, that it causes death, that it causes morbidity, sickness. So it becomes a pandemic. Within a week after it's around that time period, Within weeks of December 31st, we have a whole genome identified of this RNA virus. And yes, it starts spreading. Let me put that into perspective. 
a slow spread at first. It took us three months to go from those initial cases of people with COVID-19 to 100,000 people worldwide. It took us then 12 days for the next 100,000. And then it took us three days for the next 100,000 and two days for the 100,000 after that. So this is serious, but the optimism still shines through. Right now, we have over 300 studies going on worldwide looking at potential therapies. Right? We know some good news about the remdesivir. We know other potential treatments that are being looked into. Science, public health, medicine are reacting to this. We have almost 90 different candidates being looked at from a vaccine perspective. And we're only four or five months into this at this point. So as I tell my students all the time, if you're not an optimist and in public health, you shouldn't be in public health. The pessimists will wash out early. Still, we have to reflect on this idea of how it's affected our society. Our hearts go out to, to, to people who have experienced friends, loved ones who have had the illness, who have perhaps died from COVID-19. Beyond that is the pain, yes, of, of the economic crisis, of, of lives being disrupted. Of you, many of you on who are students of ours, understanding what a different semester you have. Now, I live this almost every day, not just as a dean, but as a dad. I have a junior in college who's sitting just down the hall here right now, studying for her last final. And I've seen the struggles of that disruption of a semester, right? Sometimes the positives of online education and sometimes the dread of that same educational process. So I'm going to finish with something that's very important that all of you hear. We have been out there working hard and we care. One of the first meetings we had at the university about this issue early in January was about caring. It was about love of our students. It was about talking about do we bring students back home from China. We then went obviously down various pathways since then ultimately leading to us setting up a system of teleeducation for the good, the health and safety of our students, of our staff, and of our faculty. That is first and foremost the mission of public health, about preventing disease, promoting health and wellness with the idea of prolonging a high quality of life. This fits into the mission that I now have as dean and the mission of our university. So now we're eager to take on your questions and we're eager to answer them. Welcome to this forum and go Terps. All right, thank you, Dean Lushniak. Thank you, those, those are that's really important uh, remarks for everybody. And thank you to all the speakers who, um, who, who gave their remarks. We're gonna open it up for questions right now. Um, before I uh, turn it up for questions, I wanna also mention that several other university leaders have joined this call. We have the Vice President of Administration and Finance, Carlo Colella. We have our General Counsel, Mike Potterella. We have our Vice President of University Relations, Jackie Lewis. And we have our Chief of Staff, Michelle Eastman, and our Vice President of Information Technology and our CIO, Jeff Hollingsworth. And finally, and not last, we have our Athletic Director, Mr. Damon Evans. You can direct any question to any of them, but we're gonna start with President Lowe, and this question comes to us from Owen in the Q&A. And his question is this, Dr. Lowe, some universities have already announced plans to open in the fall. University of Arizona, Purdue University, just to name two. Why hasn't Maryland done that? I've been in touch with all the presidents of the AAU and the presidents of the Big Ten. In fact, we have Zoom meetings on a regular basis. Purdue was one of the first public universities that announced that they will start in the fall with in-person classes. None of us have done that. Because it was the first announcement, naturally it got a lot of public attention. But if one looks very carefully at the press release, although it says we plan to open this fall, in-person education, there's a caveat. That caveat is subject to the okay of state government and subject to our meeting all the necessary 
public health requirements. Well, that's exactly what we're doing. The only difference is we did not jump the gun and we did not say that we're gonna do all these things subject to these two conditions. We are planning for it and we're taking them into account. Thank you. Our next question um, came in in advance, and I've also seen it a number of times in the Q&A function. Uh, we have received more than 100 questions today, so we're going to move as quickly as, our, as possible. This first question I'm going to direct to Patty Perillo, our Vice President for Student Affairs. Asked many different ways, but at the heart of it, the question is, what is the university doing to support students who may be experiencing extreme financial hardship? So um, colleagues, I started three months ago at the University of Maryland, and if I've learned anything, what I've learned is that this is an administration, this is a faculty, and this is a staff that cares deeply about students. And so we harnessed energy pretty quickly to think about what are the ways in which we will care for students in greatest need. And so there's three resources that I want to tell you about. First, there's the Student Crisis Fund, and to date, we have allocated over $750,000 to over 1,500 students, and that is thanks to the generous philanthropic support of our alumni and donors. We would not be able to do it without you, and we are deeply grateful that that resource is going to students directly in need who need it the most and has made a world of difference. We have a campus pantry that's available, and we allocate food for those students, faculty, and staff who are in need. And every day that it's open, on Tuesdays and Fridays when it's open, we are seeing increased number of students, faculty and staff coming to the pantry seeking resource that continues to be made available to them by the generous support of many on campus. And the third bucket that I wanna talk about is the CARES Act. And as many of you know, we will be getting resource from the federal government to be able to allocate directly to students who need the money the most, and we will be allocating those resources in the next two or three weeks directly to students who are in most need. So there are a variety of ways that we are meeting the financial need of our students who are most in need of these resources. Thank you, Patty. Um, looking through all the questions, as Katie mentioned, we're up to over 150 questions now submitted in the Q&A. Um, we have a lot um, on the same basic topic, and I'm gonna direct this to you, Carlo. Um, and uh, paraphrasing here, it goes something like this. With the anticipated negative, negative financial impact of this virus on the university's budget, what guidance can you give to faculty and staff about furloughs or budget cuts? The truth is that COVID-19 is both a threat to the physical health of our campus as well as to our financial health. We previously, previously announced the virus has cost our campus an estimated $87 million in revenue and productivity losses this fiscal year. And as the state updates its revenue projections, we expect some state budget cuts. These cuts are expected to have both near and longer term impacts. We're currently working on several different budget scenarios that consider these anticipated cuts and further revenue shortfalls. And yes, those scenarios do include furloughs as well as other cost cutting measures that are likely to impact the campus broadly. That said, we're gonna do everything we can to minimize the impact of these cuts to our university community and to preserve the academic and research mission of our university. Hey, Carlo, I have a um, moderator's privilege here to ask a follow-up question that I've also seen, and that is, is, and that is give us a sense of the timing on when we might have more information to share with the campus. Uh, the state revenue estimate forecasts are, are due shortly, so we expect uh, to hear from the University System of Maryland in the next weeks ahead uh, what uh, state uh, reductions may be and whether those are um, base budget or one-time uh, measures. So we expect in a few weeks to have a little more certainty, and then we can take our planning to a level of detail to respond to that in a, an appropriate way. Our next question goes to the provost. Um, I've seen this question pop up in two or three different ways and some questions were submitted in advance. It's around the size of lecture halls and if there's planning that's being done um, to be able to space people out and have enough room 
as well as um, some academic advisors have mentioned that their offices are quite small. Are there plans being made to be able to actually space people out to the extent that we are back in the fall? Uh, absolutely. In fact, that's, this is one of the big questions that we have um, along with how to space people in residence halls about, about coming back in person next fall. Uh, if we have to maintain social distancing with six feet spaces between, uh, you can imagine it significantly diminishes the capacity of our um, uh, classrooms and offices. I think as far as advising goes, it seems to be going very well online. Obviously, it's nothing uh, is as good as in person, um, but uh, I think online advising is probably feasible going forward as long as we have to maintain the social distancing. <clears throat> Excuse me, classrooms are another story. Our biggest classroom is has a capacity of, I think, 550 students. If you maintain social distancing in that, its capacity is diminished to 57 students. <laughs> so we're looking at venues, all, the large venues all over campus to use as classroom substitutes for in-person delivery, as well as even beyond the campus borders, the hotels and so on. We haven't worked this out yet. We're in the process. I have a work group, a subgroup, from the academic group that I've pulled together, looking at exactly this and what it might mean for scheduling changes and so on. Probably means that many of the large uh, classes will need to be online or at least be blended. But again, we are, we're in the process right now, deep into it, trying to work out the scenarios and figure out what would work, what we can use, and how to get the answers back to you as soon as possible. So yes, you're asking a very good question. And yes, there's an issue and we're working on it. Thank you, Provost Rankin. Uh, the next question is gonna go to you, Patty, but I'm also, ask, also gonna ask Boris to weigh in on this because, it's, because this is about health. Um, lots of questions from uh, Blaze and Margarita that essentially ask, will the health center be able to test for COVID-19 um, when we reopen? So it is our hope that we will be testing um, upon return. As, as all of us are reading, it's one of the most important things that we can do as a way to keep our community safe and well. And we will only move forward if we can keep our community safe and well. It is our design to bring people back to campus, but we will only do it in a way that keeps people safe and well. So I've had conversations with our director of the University Health Center, Dr. Sacred Bodison, and she and her team absolutely wanna be testing and of course, it depends on the tests that are available and what resource we have available to us. And I know Dean Luzniak, you can add to that. Great, I think uh, the next strategy, you know, and this is not just the College Park community, not just us, but in essence, you know, the state, the region, the nation, and the world, it's all about testing, testing, testing. So we have to feel comfortable to make sure that whatever's happening at that point in time, that we are testing the appropriate people at the appropriate time and doing appropriate things, right, with people who test positive. So the, the strategy from the bigger public health picture is testing, it's tracing or tracking one's exposures, right, with people around us, and ultimately it's making sure that we treat those people who do have COVID-19 appropriately and then do isolation and quarantine where indicated. So you're taking that bigger public health picture and now you're putting into the public health, into the College Park community. And that's a key move. So it's a lot more difficult to try to predict where we're going to be in those months ahead. Because right now, all of you online know, the testing issue has turned into a national debacle, right? I'll, I'll be honest about it. And we're trying to catch up. We want to and need to implement the best thing for our faculty, staff, and students at the time that we reopen. And that will include aspects of testing, as well as, don't forget, there's the sense of serology, the idea of antibodies, right? Whether I am exposed in the past, unclear how that ties into whether I'm immune or not, but that's now late breaking news with multiple products coming out. So the world is changing almost by the day in terms of what tools we may have to make important decisions for the good of our students, faculty, and staff. 
And Brian, I just want to underscore one of the things that Dean Luzniak said is that um, I'm chairing the student life working group that uh, President Lowe named in his framework for our gradual re reopening. And I just want to let our colleagues know that on that working group, we have Prince George County health officials that are a part of it and city of College Park leaders as well, because what we know is that we are situated in a city and in a county and we will work closely with our colleagues as we step forward. Thank you, Patty. And uh, Dean Lushniak, I'm going to keep you on the hot seat because we have received so many questions in the Q&A function um, around PPE. And it's a, an acronym that wasn't uh, known to everyone before this, but for those who may not know, it is personal protective equipment. And it's a question around, are we going to be required to wear it? Will the university provide it? And I think it's a public health question as much as it's an administrative question. So let's start with you. Great, and that again is an important part of the armamentarium that we're using right now to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And allow me just to briefly reflect on even how that has transitioned over time, right? We started out, probably the proper approach was, okay, personal protective equipment, PPE, only for healthcare providers, those taking care of people who are ill with COVID-19. Right? And even then, the recommended PPE was in short supply, so we ended up sort of modifying things along the way. One can critique whether that was proper or not, it was necessary. Ultimately, we went from a sense of telling people, if you're out there in the general public, you don't need to use masks, they may not be helpful, to now the opposite. The reality of mask wearers, first and foremost, I'll remind you, is what? It's not about protecting ourselves from others, it in fact the purpose of wearing a mask right now for the general population is to protect others from us. So personal protective equipment at this point in time is a key feature. And we, and I'll mention the task force that I'm co-chair on along with Mike Paterella, uh, is our, our health safety and risk mitigation task force. And that's gonna be a key feature of discussion, right? Of PPE wear, that is whether we're wearing masks or not on campus, if we were to open campus now, which we're not, and we don't have any indications that we're ready for this, that's what we would be wearing because that's where, what I wear at the Safeway down the street. Anytime I'm going out in public, we're wearing it per the recommendations of both the state and the county I live in. So we're gonna have to tackle this in terms of looking at that point in time with reopening is what's going to be the state of affairs regarding COVID-19? Have we seen the necessary decreases for us to get to the point of making sure that we can gather together in larger groups, i.e. a campus atmosphere, and then what measures are we taking, including the use of personal protective equipment? Whether we bring our own, whether it's issued to us, how do we enforce all this? Uh, but right now, don't forget, the key rules, and we're trying to implement this in any opening plans. Right now, I'm following the rules that the state is telling me and the, and the feds are still recommending, right? We've talked about the issue of, of physical distancing, right? The six foot rule still applies and we need to implement that into our plans and the use of personal protective equipment needs to be applied. So yes, we're heading in that direction. What will divert change us is all of a sudden there's a massive shift of, of you know, decreased number of cases and all this goes away. Guess what? That's probably not gonna happen in time for the fall for all of this to go away. So. Don't want to burst anybody's bubbles out there. So we have to prepare for the use of personal protective equipment on campus. Thank you, Dean Lushniak. We have about a dozen questions. This was about the same topic. This is going to go to you, Patty, uh, including this one from McKinsey. When do you anticipate letting the students get back into the dorms to retrieve their things? Well, we, we look forward to that. And we know students, you look forward to it too, and so do your family. So we are still, we're working with the, the state of Maryland system as well as with the, the state to make sure that we are able to allow you to come back in ways that keep us all safe and healthy and well. So it is our hope um, that soon after commencement, after you get through finals, that soon after comm commencement, we'll be able to allow you to come back in a way that allows for sequencing, that allows for social distancing, that does it in a way that keeps people safe and healthy and again, we haven't rolled out those plans yet because we want to finalize information from both the state and the Maryland system before we do so. But it's our hope to release that information sooner rather than later. Thank you, Patty. Okay, Provost Franken, back to you. Um, several questions coming through the, the Q&A on pass-fail. 
Um, the questions are, are both around uh, the why a move to pass fail in the spring, but not the summer. And then also, is it, can we be flexible on the deadline for uh, when we choose to choose a letter grade or pass fail? So could you speak to that, Provost Franken? I can, and I'm, I'll ask Jeff Hollingsworth also to chime in on the second part of it, but um, we decided to go to uh, letter grades, back to letter grades, starting this summer and then into the fall, because pass-fail doesn't give an adequate record for many things post-graduation um, for students. And, you know, it's a, it's an, a reasonable emergency measure to uh, get us through the end of the semester, but I, it's not a long-term solution for grades. And I think going forward into the fall, we're going to be focusing this summer on helping faculty get much better at delivering online instruction, not just remote instruction, but really designed on learning, online um, teaching that allows for different kinds of assessment, uh, less of this proctored high stakes assessment, more of ongoing assessment by um, project-based instruction and other means. Um, and uh, in general, make it possible to have a, a better, more creative learning environment, uh, online blended or in person if we, if we, to the extent we can do that. Um, Marcio and his team and the TLTC have been working very hard on that and we're gonna focus very hard on it through the summer. So I think people will find that letter grading is less uh, onerous, more like a normal situation as we go into the fall. As far as when to decide whether to go pass fail or, the, or the, take the letter grade, there are various reasons for making this decision. One is because it, I think, is the appropriate one as far as faculty and the deans are concerned and <clears throat> in terms of making that choice. But it's also unfortunately true, and here I turn to Jeff, that our um, student information system technology isn't capable of handling um, a, a, a change in this after uh, final exam. So Jeff, you want to speak to that? Yeah, unfortunately, our student information system, as many people know, was written in the 1980s and is somewhat limited. It took a near heroic effort to create this opportunity to select up through uh, the last day of class and make that available. Uh, realize that also once letter grades are submitted, grades are submitted, whether they're pass fail or letter, they immediately need to be used for other things like determining which classes students need in the summer. And so we have a very short window of time to get the spring grades finalized for all the things they need to be done. And we just didn't have an opportunity to be able to do that if we allowed changes after finals between pass fail and letter grading. Great, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Marianne. Um, okay, this next question is gonna be for Damon. Damon, we have a question from Michael. Uh, and Michael wants to know, um, look into your crystal ball, are we going to be playing football in the fall? And will there be fans? Great question, Michael. And uh, I remain uh, optimistic about the fall, about all fall sports, including football. And there's a lot of talk uh, in intercollegiate athletics. What does the fall look like? Right now, we don't have the answer to uh, where we'll be in the fall. But I do know this, we are working on many different scenarios out there to take a look to see how we can best preserve the sports season. But I'm reminded that it's not the most important thing. Everything that we do will be guided by uh, our state government, our university and our university system. And it's important that we understand that the health and safety and welfare of all those concerned is of utmost importance. So we'll continue to work to make sure that when that time comes, we'll be ready but we do remain optimistic about the fall and hopefully we'll be back out there on the fields of play and giving everyone something to cheer for. Thank you, Damon. Uh, the next question we're going to pose to Carlo as our Vice President for Administration and Finance. Uh, he oversees facilities management and we're seeing a lot of questions about deep cleaning and what that looks like for whenever we return um, and in whatever capacity, what is the plan for deep cleaning? Our housekeeping services have continued cleaning uh, the few occupied 
areas of the campus that are still in service, uh, uh, research activities and so forth. Given the length of time since we've been on campus, when the non-occupied buildings are returned into service, they will be cleaned with a focus on high touch public areas such as restrooms and hallways, conference rooms and kitchens. After that, housekeeping services will continue cleaning according to normal schedules, and of course, provide any timely disinfecting of spaces when warranted by public health determination. Thank you, thank you, Carlo. Um, before, I, before I ask the next question, there, there was something that came into the Q&A that I think everybody can, can get behind here. It was a shout out to Jeff Hollingsworth and his team for getting Zoom up and running for, for online education and online teaching. That was, that was quite an effort, so kudos to you, Jeff. That was from Jessica in the, in the, in the Q&A. Uh, this next question is for Lori. Lori, we have a question from George, and George wants to know, um, what's the timetable to, re to get out of the severe um, research restrictions, and what are the guidelines and best practices for ramping up research? So that's a great question. And so right now I have a committee that's been formed to work on, uh, on that exact question, about look at how we could reopen the campus. And right now for research purposes, and um, we've been looking at phased in approaches. Of course, we will begin by following all of the guidelines and local regulations. We'll follow the governor's orders um, and also Pr Prince George's County. And we have been thinking about phasing in research and looking at uh, different things, of, uh, different ways to phase in research, including limiting occupancy initially, and of course, following all the rules that, uh, and, and guidelines and guidances that have come out regarding PPE and social distancing, and, um, and even looking at, uh, at ways that we can have people streamline into laboratories moving us in a single flow, like a single point of entry. Um, one of the things about researchers is that researchers in many fields are used to very strict adherence to PPE. They know this word. <laughs> They've been using PPE for, for most of their lives. And they are also used to following very strict regulatory safety and local guidelines. So we do be, anticipate being able to reduce the risk through these types of measures in a research environment. Okay, thank you. Um, I do have a question that I'd like to pose to Boris, uh, Dean Lushniak. It's around crossing state lines. What happens when Maryland lifts restrictions, but DC does not, or Virginia does not? How are we working collectively? Well, you know, we are taking a, a regional approach, I think, from the government aspect. You know, what Governor Hogan has, has been doing is, is, you know, much like other states have begun looking at the region together. And so it's really Virginia, DC, and, and Maryland uh, combining forces in terms of looking at a path forward. I know that there are obviously uh, other pressures out there for, for states to move ahead uh, more quickly. I think we're going to hear an update for where, where Governor Hogan is, is heading uh, sometime this week. Uh, when it comes to working, you know, it, it'll sort of be interesting in that one of the things that can happen, and, and this can happen from, from the aspect of, of if we were to open and other places still remain closed, which is highly doubtful since we're taking this regional approach, that the idea of going to your workplace would then be considered as part of the opening in, you know, in your state where you work and, and with proper documentation saying that I'm heading to work right now. Uh, would probably apply. But I'm not a lawyer, uh, but I'm a public health person. And I'll, I'll tell you right now that more than likely, we're going to be coordinating very well across the region. So hopefully, we don't end up into that problem. This next question is going to go to Carlo. Carlo, lots of questions about telework. Uh, lots of questions about around the subject of Will we have to come back to work? What if we're taking care of children? What if we're taking care of, uh, of our parents? What accommodations is the campus going to be able to provide for our staff? We're planning to continue work from home accommodations for faculty, staff, and students who have high risk health conditions who are caring for children or parents or other loved ones. So we intend to continue teleworking to the extent possible. 
Thank you, Carlo. Okay, we have a question um, from Brittany, and this question goes to Georgina. Um, it, it can go to all, uh, many of us, but I'll direct it to Georgina first. What are we doing um, to look out for Asian American students or Asian faculty um, who may feel targeted as um, we come back together as a community? How can we support them? I think that this is a real opportunity for us to come together in, as a community to provide support and sustenance for the Asian and Asian American communities who have been made the brunt of an issue that is not theirs. This is an international issue. This is something that belongs to the world in the field of health. This has nothing to do with anyone's personal identity. We have learned that this virus does not discriminate in any way. And as a campus, I think it's important for us to be aware that the Asian and Asian American community have been made the brunt of blame and to provide that support to them. And I also want to encourage people who may be impacted to reach out to the resources that are available to you, both on campus as well as the national resources. Um, the Council of Korean Americans has been conducting some really fantastic webinars and they actually have a site where you can go and see some national resources that are available via a Google Doc. I think, thank you, Georgina. Thank you. Um, this next question is gonna go to Patty. Patty, we have a, we have a, fair, a fair number of questions about Re students returning to the dorms. If we still have physical distancing in place, physical distancing measures, how will we bring our students back into our residence halls? So as you've heard um, from Dean Luzniak that we will bring folks back as long as we're able to have some testing, PPEs, contact tracing, creating social distancing. And so they will be guides for us bringing students back to the residence halls. And so just like my other colleagues have talked about, there's a working group that I'm leading, the Student Life Working Group, and I have a group of colleagues in resident life, in residential facilities, working in partnership with faculty in the School of Public Health to begin to look at how is it that we create a living environment where students are able to live together in the residence halls in a safe way, thinking about the relationship between the, the rooms and the bathrooms, the rooms and the community spaces, the rooms and the elevators, the rooms and the HVAC systems. And so we are actually next week going to present to the cabinet a series of recommendations for us to consider moving forward, always taking into account the health and well being of our students in the community. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Um, uh, we've heard from a lot of people in the Q&A that you did not get a chance to see the poll results. So I'm going to ask uh, that we display those poll results for you so you can all enjoy in, in, in your votes. So let's put up the first question and the results, please. There you go. Everybody can see that now. The question was, what do you miss most about being present on campus? And it was, it, it was clearly seeing each other, right? If you take that first answer and the last answer, it was really we're, we're, we're missing each other a lot. All right, now if we could take that down and put up the second question so people could see. The second one was, what have you incorporated into your routine to manage the transition to being online? This one was much closer, um, but still connecting with friends uh, was, a big, was a big part of it, followed closely by more time outside and, and, and exercise. And this idea of, okay, we can take that poll down, thanks. I have one, I have, I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask Dean Lushniak a question. Given these poll results, tell us a little bit about the importance of staying connected while we're still physically distant. Well, you know, I was hoping you'd ask me that question because <laughs> it's obviously overwhelming in terms of seeing that response of how we are social creatures, right? I mean, this is important. And how we've actually, you know, gotten beyond the use of the term social distancing, right? Because that denotes the whole idea that we're not connecting with others. We're really talking about the, the parameters of physical distancing. You know, imagine your life of being limiting ourselves with a six foot circle around us. You know, some people imagine this idea that we, we have a, a hoop skirt from the old days of six foot and, and don't step over that. <laughs> that doesn't mean that we aren't social creatures. And, and it's great to see from our polls of how we cherish that. You know, 
I'll tell you, I, as a dean, as a public health person, as a physician, you know, the last two weeks have been rough. I've been kind of going kind of batty with this idea. Not that I don't love my wife and my two daughters here at home, but, but I finally turn to members of my staff and I go, you know, I honestly miss you. I miss seeing you. I miss interacting with you. And the whole idea is how do we feel better about this? Continue your social interactions in whatever form it is. Let's be more open with each other of how we feel about each other, right? You know, it's not a sign of weakness to show emotion, to show love, to show respect, to show that we are missing something important. I think the other feature that's critical out there is the idea of, of doing something out of the ordinary, whether it's exercise, I'm a big fan of that as a public health person, whether it's walking in the woods, I do that every day. In fact, right before this meeting, I took my da daily walk. We live in Rockville, Maryland. I walk down the street, I end up in the woods and I go visit the baby eagles at the nest where they've been nesting every year for the last five years and I'm there like a complete nerd, a pair of binoculars. I have my, I go with my family. So it's always the three, four of us going. And that's my way of purging, right? The idea of that, us playing, you know, the, the, the whole kind of concept of mental health is critical in all of this. And yes, I'm going to be a major advocate, which is although I'm an, you know, epidemiologist, I'm a physician, I'm all that, I want to keep, as Dr. Lowe said, finding the latest information and reading the latest studies and all that. I'm actually forcing myself to back away from the news every so often. That is so critical. So learn something new, connect with new people, get to know the people around you, live life to the ultimate. Because what is a curse? Us having this COVID-19 can be a blessing that we open ourselves and our minds and our abilities to something brand new. And we love and cherish things that maybe we've taken for granted in the past. Thank you, Boris. I think I speak for everybody. We're really, really happy to have you on our team, Dean Lushniak. Thank you very much for those, for, for those remarks. Um, and I have one more thing, which is really important from a public health act, and that's because there's, there's data that's coming in on this. The whole issue of drinking and drug use, right, in the midst of having this, this social distancing, as I describe it, physical distancing. Be wary of that. We're seeing incredible numbers of people who have had you know, issues with substance abuse, resorting to that as a coping mechanism, and also just the, the liquor sales and, and other bad things for you from a public health perspective. Please, please avoid, and if you're running into problems, turn to somebody to talk to about those problems. I can't neglect that important part. Sorry for interrupting you, Brian. No, no, thank you. Thank you very much for that, for that, for that caveat. Um, I'm going to turn, I'm going to ask the last question of this town hall. I really appreciate almost 3,000 of you being with us for this for this past uh, uh, 70 minutes here. And uh, President Lowe, I'm going to direct this last question to you. And here's the question. And it really wraps up what the common thread is through all almost 400 questions that we've received. And that is this. Will things be back to normal in the fall? Will things be back to normal in the fall? That's the question. Uh, you know, that reminds me of what the great American philosopher Yogi Berra once said. Maybe making predictions is difficult, especially about the future. I cannot predict what's going to happen next fall. I don't know that anybody can. At some point, this virus will be eradicated. But when that happens, because there's a vaccine, there are treatments, we don't know. I'm inclined to reframe that question. And the way I will reframe that question is, what is the future that we want to create because of this crisis? Because I think a crisis of this magnitude is in a way a harbinger of the future. We now stand at a portal in which we can accelerate the future. We can anticipate what future we want to create. So the question then is, when will we go back to how things were before the pandemic? I would say, I would frame the question differently. 
and this is for the entire campus community. When that virus is eradicated, do we really want to go to how this university has been functioning before the pandemic? Do we want to go back to a society that was functioning the way it was functioning before the pandemic? Or do we want to create a post-pandemic normal? So let me be specific. Do we want to create a world of education, of learning and teaching that combines the best of in-person education, residential experience with the best that the finals of online education can offer? A blended kind of education, or do we want to go back to how we used to teach before? One example. In addition, the area of work. I have already heard from a number of staff asking the question, will it be possible someday in which we don't have to come to work every single day? We could sometimes telework from home, sometimes we come to campus and think about how work will be changed and, and the implications. If say hypothetically one third or one fourth of our staff can't telework, but they also want to come in. But that could dramatically reduce the number of cars that come to campus, the sustainability impact, the number of buildings that we will need. In other words, the nature of work will be transformed. How? I don't know, but we can create it. Intercollegiate athletics. It is a huge enterprise. It's a very important enterprise. We know that there are enormous demands on intercollegiate athletics, such as pay for play. Is this the time to re-envision how intercollegiate athletics should operate in the post-pandemic world? So the enormous challenge and the incredible opportunity, recognizing that this crisis has almost accelerated the future, and I will be leaving this university that I've come to love for the past 10 years. And I will always love this university. But I, the challenge and the opportunity for the faculty, staff, and students, and alumni who remain is, can we make this an even better, an even stronger university? A university that will help make our country a better and stronger nation. Thank you so much for that, President Lowe. Um, thank you for your remarks and your leadership. Thank you to all of our panelists today, but most of all, thank you to our participants for taking time out of your daily lives to join us and stay connected as a community. Uh, please take care of yourselves. This ends today's town hall. Please be well. <laughs>